I am Angela Ferguson from the Onondaga Nation. I belong to the Eel Clan and what we are doing here today, I'm over at Ganond again, helping braid corn, my favorite activity. I love doing this. <laughs> so what I'm doing right now is prepping the corn to make sure it will fit comfortably in the braid by trimming off the little ends on our Tusker or white corn. That's what this variety is. We have many varieties of Iroquois white corn, but this particular one here is the Tuscarora variety. And so I am clipping these pieces of where the cob was attached to the stock to take them off because when we put our braids we want the ends to be as close together as possible so that they don't fall apart. Sometimes you're able to pull these with your hands but not with this variety usually because they're so large. And then I also take a look if I see anything that has any mold on it or anything like that. Then I take that off so it doesn't spread inside the corn crib. Just pull those pieces right out. This mold can spread real fast. And then we've also saved some of the, um, after we open these up, we saved some of the whiter husks to make our handles. And again, I'll pull off the, the mold pieces. You can always use that for, um, a lot of times I save the corn kernels that I'm, I'm letting go of. I save that and throw that back out on the snow in winter time and the deer love to come and eat that. So that way nothing nothing goes to waste. And then our hunters usually get back out there and hunt some of the deer so in a roundabout way we get it back <laughs> in one form or another. So how is this corn used, Ange? Like, what do you, traditionally, what would people be doing with it, or how would it be used, and what are things that you've this been able to This is one of our main staples. You know, there's there's more than uh, one way to eat it. It's just white corn. So we also eat it as green corn when it's before it's all the way to seed. This is seed form right here when it's complete maturity. But when it's actually green, it doesn't. To us, it means the plant is still green not the corn. So the actual cob itself sometimes is green, the inner part right here, but the kernels are still white, but they're milky, like um, sweet corn. And so there's several ways to prepare that. That's one way we eat it. When it's like this and it's still milky, um, in between that green corn and the uh, seed phase, there's a period where you can actually make a gunsat, which is, um, almost like, almost to the hominy stage, almost like that, but it's it's scraped off of the cob, yeah. and it's still, again, milky, what they call, when there's still uh, milk inside of the kernels. So right now, it's chalky. They're not wet. Mm. The inside starch is dried, and the germ underneath is, is actually ready to plant. So sometimes, even when you're opening these up, you might even see a sprout. Like if they get enough water and sunlight at the right moment, you'll even have sprouts on some of these. So this is like an example of, uh, well, I don't know, we might have to, but now I'm going to rescue this. I'll try to take it off down here. Um, we also roast, roast the kernels which they can either be uh, baked in an oven or even over an open fire. 
And what does the roasting do to it? Does it kind of give it a different flavor? It does. It gives it like a smoke. It's almost like smoked corn. It tastes smoky. Okay. And a little bit of a nuttier type of. Yeah. Yeah. A little more earthy. Um, I love that kind. And you can make cornbread out of any of it. But the important, the important part to remember is doing the, uh, the scientific word is nixtamalization. There it is. But for us, it, we always called it washing, washing corn, meaning that we're going to put the wood ashes on the kernels. Uh, there's several different ways that I've seen it done. Uh, we wait until it's completely dry, and then we take it, uh, shell it off of the, the actual cob, then use the kernels to bake. But I've seen uh, the Ho-Chunk people take the cobs like this and drop the entire cob in the wood ashes. That's, so that's kind of a neat process to watch. And then the hulls come off while it's on here. And then they scrape it off of the cob and sun dry it. So I actually might try that next year, try that process. So traditional Haudenosaunee or Iroquois style would be as to add hardwood ashes to a boiling pot of water correct and then yep. you would have the shelled corn the, the, the kernels taken off the cob and incorporate that into the, the pot or the boiling water right. with the ashes and then that would release the hull which is kind of firm and tough right and then making it easier to then be able to um, produce or do things with or right well the other thing that happens that's really important is that there's certain nutrition nutritional vitamins in these seeds that are not present unless you do the nixtamalization process so um, like I was I did a demonstration recently where I, I had it in a pot I had my hardwood ashes I do the hardwood ashes first and then I drop the corn in and as soon as I drop it within five seconds the corn should rise to the top and be orange yeah it changes the and color. if you don't have enough Mm -hmm. It takes longer, so that means you need more wood ashes. You didn't put oh, enough in. Oh, I see. So um, it shouldn't be more than five seconds before you see that orange pop right, pop right to the top. No kidding. So that's the key to using hardwood ashes. And a lot of people are like, well, what is hardwood? You know, and I always tell people, if you're not really familiar with trees and what hardwood is, it's the ones that drop their leaves last. So when all the others have leaves fall into the ground and you see there's still trees that have them those are the hardwoods the maples the oaks things like that gotcha. they'll still have leaves they're the last ones to drop their leaves gotcha. so it's and a good way for people to familiarize themselves with so what kind of wood the way that you get the hardwood ashes it's you know it's coming out of a wood fire or something like that you're harvesting the ashes afterwards right, and then correct. you're just kind of saving them for well you're sifting them you know we have we had uh sifting baskets you know prior to colonial times but uh you can even use a not, you know, just a, what you would sift flour with, right? Oh yeah. So you want to take the big chunks of charred uh, wood out. Mm. You know, you don't want that to go into the yeah. seam. So you just need the fine ashes part. Mm -hmm. And I also found, just a little side note, um, if you let your ashes compost, like I'll put them in tubs and I store them, mm. and I'll let them sit there for a couple of years. Oh. And I, so I have rotating ones that I use every year, but yeah. the ones that have been sitting longer, they work, they're more potent. Mm. So it might be full like this to the top with wood ashes. And when I go and get it two years later, it's probably maybe three quarters to half. Yeah. So it's composted itself and it becomes stronger. So it really works. It's also a mixture of a couple different types of maybe ash as well, or are you trying to keep it all the same? It's all hard. For me, I only use hardwood. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I'm just saying a different varietal of tree. Like it what? could be some yeah. maple, could mm -hmm. be some other. Okay. Right. So it's pretty interesting to see how, what the difference is. It doesn't usually take, with those kind of wood ashes, it doesn't usually take more than 20 minutes. To, and so it's almost more like a fine process. flour then that you're using that's at, that you're adding to the boiling pot and that's what it is, not so much the big chunks or the big chunks. No, pieces. no, you're sifting it all out. So, uh, you know, the sifting part is another part that needs to take place where you're, you're um, taking those, you throw the whole pile in there, you sift so that you get the fine, the fine powder and what's left over I put in the garden because it prevents weeds and stuff from growing in those spots. So it's good compost to put back in the garden, the, the larger chunks that are left from that. And it also prevents bugs in the garden. So you also can use it to store your corn in to prevent mold, cornmeal, moths, worms, anything that might get into your stuff just from nature, you know. Um, you can store them in wood ashes. 
use use your leftover stuff. Since you're gonna wash it in that in them anyway, it's actually a good idea to do that. So now there's another process here that you guys are working through, and that's actually pulling off the corn silk. Yes, yep, yeah, we're saving the corn silk. And I keep on telling everyone this is the cure for diabetes right here. You can make tea out of this after it's dried, and you can drink that to lower your um, your sugar levels, but you also can use it as broth to cook with for all of your soups. So a lot of times if I make a big pot of this, I'll let it cool down and I freeze it in case I need it for something else. I use a lot of the corn products, I'm trying to like go back to our ancestral diets. So instead of using like white flour to make gravy, I use the ground up corn flour from this because it adds um, the flavor of the corn to the food. And obviously it's better for you than just um, processed or bleached white flour. It's also a, a gluten-free option. Right, and it, and it uh, thickens any of your stews or, or even drinks. Um, I put some of this out sometimes instead of coffee creamer so that people will take a little bit of that, oh, stir yeah. their coffee, and it thickens it up, and mm. it makes it creamy. But it tastes like corn mixed in, and people oh. really enjoy it. It tastes good. Wow. Does it kind of mellow out the acidity of uh, coffee sometimes? It does, it's, yeah. especially if it's like kind of bitter, you know. But then you can taste the hint of that corn. So, uh, and then instead of using sugar, we, you know, we're using maple syrup to sweeten it. Oh, yeah. So you're mixing the coffee with the corn and maple sugar. I mean, because coffee is considered actually a sacred drink to many of the uh, South American and Central American tribes. It was one of the first things that a lot of natives traded for because we couldn't grow uh, the coffee beans in our climate up here. Yeah. We had things that they couldn't, so we traded for things like that, salt and other items, you know. And then, uh, yeah, we say this, and, and it doesn't, like, a little goes a long way, so when you're making your little tea steeper, you know, you might need this little ball, but you can, uh, you can make big batches out of, like, a chunk like this, and then you can divvy it up into smaller containers to freeze it. So to do that, would you put it in, like, a cheesecloth or something? Yeah, or like, yeah, yeah or, or even a tea steeper, you know, that has the little, um, the metal ball with the, the ball, yeah, yeah. with the netting, yeah. But you could also just use any, um, I, I myself just put it right in there. Oh, yeah. It kind of settles to the bottom after it's um, heated up, but... Yeah, so all, there's so many different foods here, you know, not just the corn silk, but also corn husks can be used for so many things. Like when you make tamales, even Haudenosaunee people made tamales, mm -hmm. and we even used green corn leaves so that when you're boiling or steaming them, really, what you're doing is steaming them. They used to make most of our foods in fire pits, so everything was put underneath, you know, and, and steam was a big part of that. So you get the taste of the corn again when you rehydrate a husk. Mm -hmm. And there's even corn husk tea that you can make the same thing. Now I understand that maybe the corn silks also were good for medicinal purposes for women and things like that yes. during their cycles and mm -hmm. things. Um, is that a practice that still takes yeah, place? Yeah, I mean a lot of our medicine people are getting back to, to using some of these um, old remedies instead of relying on modern medicine because it our bodies respond to it a lot better. And there's also different... Um, like, there's different purposes for different kernels, even on the seeds, you know? Um, like, for an example, I had um, a gentleman from the Red Lake Nation. He is an elder. He's, um, he's Ojibwe or Anishinaabe. And um, he was telling me that all these kernels are like a village of people, and they all have a responsibility and a duty to the village. So this first bunch right here, their job is to feed the animals. So if you notice, when it's time to pick and harvest, the, this is where the birds will peck. This is where the deer nibble. Mm -hmm. They don't take the whole thing. They just start nibbling to let you know it's ready. And if you don't get out and harvest that, they'll come back and they'll take the next you don't do your duties, the next part, this is the seeds for the future generations, is in the middle. 
So you have to feed the animals first to keep them going. You have to mm -hmm. keep the future generations going. And then this is the food for the people. Wow. So... And this, so that's kind of down towards where the thicker part of the right. stock is, and it's mm -hmm. kind of hard. And they're, and they're bigger kernels, and if you notice, like, say if you are busy with modern life and you're, you don't get to your garden, mm -hmm. when you know, you see them little, they're starting to peek through because the birds are pecking at it, and then you don't get out there. If you notice, this part's always gone, but they never take this. <laughs> so it's like even the animals know. And if you don't get out to get that, then they'll come back and take that too. So that's when you find all empty cobs and... Um, You've got to be more vigilant you know it's like a reminder to you of like oh gosh when i see that corn ready i got to get out there you know no dilly dallying huh. so yeah and i and i pay attention to that because i've found some of the medicine uh, you know there's certain uh, like there's a medicine corn at the tip sometimes you'll find a perfectly rounded tip of corn and then in the center it almost looks like a flower and there's one kernel in the center and that one is really powerful or strong medicine and sometimes it's so strong it will actually be um, protruding from the corn and it'll be this one little kernel at the top you know mm. so we always pay attention to those as we're opening them and that's why we don't just kind of rip through it and throw things around and kind of gently open them up because you don't know which ones you're gonna come across well before we started filming here we were talking about you know no you know angry medicine or angry food and things like that so when you come in and you do this type of work you're kind of in a frame of mind you know when you come to approach the the, the plant itself and the, and the product here um you know what is that what is that like for you like what is that kind of that process when you're getting yourself to work with uh the the, the iroquois white corn well it's really uh it's exciting you know when you know that it's ready and you get out there and when I'm like entering the field, I, I feel like you forget about all of the difficulties it took you to get there, you know, like all of the sweating and the back breaking, weed pulling and just the bug bites and all those things, you know, it's like once it's harvest time, you forget all about that and you're so thankful. And, um, I, you know, one of the thoughts that always enters my mind every year when I go to harvest corn or pick I wonder what must it be like for a person who has none, yeah. has no access, doesn't have a garden, doesn't know anybody else that plants, doesn't have a friend that plants that they could be a participant in something like this. Um, I couldn't imagine, you know, not having anything to pick at harvest time. So I always try to encourage people, even if you can do one small thing, you know, try it. You'll like it. <laughs> and then people usually do get connected because it becomes their sanctuary their garden becomes their their safe place you know and um, and then again at harvest time once you're you're getting to work on all these things it's it's a really good feeling you know and then to, to go through that whole process there's that ongoing joke how do you make corn soup and then the first sentence is well first you clear the field right and that's how you start the sentence when someone asks you that <laughs> And it's so true, right? Because you got to first clear the feet, clear the land, get started, and that's really the beginning of the process. The recipe goes like so far back than than getting it on your table, right? <laughs> and so for you, I mean, can you take me through a little bit of that process? I mean, like, what is the you know the start to finish you know product? You know, like the seed goes in the ground up until you know you're braiding it here, it hangs, it dries. About how long does that take? I mean, just for, so people don't understand that a little bit. So from the time we do this process here, so, I mean, if anybody's wondering what this is, this is unpollinated corn. So it means that for whatever reason, pollen did not reach the corn silks except for three pieces. <laughs> mm. So, and I even saved these. Oh, there's one more. Four. So I saved those because... That's how our ancestors were. They didn't waste and throw things out, you know. Somebody's going to eat that. <laughs> Every little kernel counts. So when I, um, I'm trying to learn a lot of old recipes because we lost a lot of our, our food ways, you know, uh, um, just through wars and uh, relocations and land displacement and so many other things a lot of those that knowledge went somewhere mm. i don't think it disappeared we didn't lose it yeah. somewhere we just have to tap into it and 
I've even gotten some of the information on how to prepare some of the foods through like old journals and, mm-hmm. and papers that I was able to find where we, you know, prior to that had been an oral tradition people. I think our ancestors had the foresight to realize, like, I better write this down for them before they sure. lose it. Yeah. So a lot of things we've been able to find. And somehow our seeds have been making their way back to us. Yeah. So for this white corn, which was such a big staple to our our whole confederacy, um, I think that's why our ancestors were so creative with the ways to make it taste different or pleasing in the, you know different times of the year so that it never uh, you never ate it the same way twice you know so I've been making different um, corn breads and things like that out of all the corns not just the white you know we're so used to having just uh, white corn with kidney beans for our, our traditional cornbread but you can actually make it with any of the, the flour corn blue the roasted, yeah. uh, the red, the yellow, the, all of them. And then trying to put different fruits and berries and things like that, sweetening them with maple syrup, you know, instead of using water, use that as the sticky agent to hold it. Hmm. There's so many other ways we can uh, make our foods, like, adapt our young people again to wanting to eat these things, because our babies forgot what this tasted like, some of them. And that blue corn is supposed to be their first food. So pretty much most of our foods are baby friendly. Yeah. So you can give babies squash, right? Mm-hmm. And you can give babies um, corn mush and things yeah. like that. They can. They actually don't probably uh, digest the whole corn itself, but we used to thicken it mm-hmm. and give them that um, almost like... It's milky. It's yeah. something that you can, and it has nutrients in it, so that they don't need to have to digest um, nixtamalized corn. Yeah. You can actually just have the the broth, more or less. From that broth, you know, contains a lot of nutrients if you prepare it properly. Yeah, yeah I was pretty proud that one of the first solid foods that my daughter ate was actually um, white corn mush. Right, the mush. mush and mm-hmm. A little bit of maple syrup and that was one of the first solid foods that she had ever had and it was kind and of a, a moment of pride. And then they forget that. Yeah. yeah. I mean that is something you should be proud of because <laughs> it triggers the, their ancestral memory. Like that's what we always fed them first, you know? And so like um, our beans were more like a mashed they could always be mashed up. Yeah. And that could be fed. Yep. And then the squash, you know, was easy to feed and digest. Mm. Uh, there's so many different things that are traditional mm-hmm. foods that could be you know, baby foods. A lot of our mothers, young mothers, are getting back to some of those things instead yeah. of buying commercialized yeah. baby food or even making their own out of vegetables yeah. and pureeing their own foods. Because that's really all it is, yeah. you know. But then we add all these sugars and salt and different things that babies don't need, yeah. you know, just to make it taste better. But if that's what you're accustomed to from the get-go, then you don't become, uh, you know, you're used to tasting food because salt dulls your taste buds, right? So. Mm. You, it's good. You need. It's a necessity. You have to have it to be alive. So salt was a big part of our diet, yeah. um, especially in our our confederacy. And there's several tribes in the southwest that had access to salt, and that's part of why we were so strong. Yes. Yeah. You've got to have salt to survive. So mm. places that didn't have it would have to trade with us yeah. to get it. And it was, salt was a big currency along with white corn. So mm. the food used to be our power and our, our not only our currency, but it was our economy and it was also our sustenance. So there's, there's so much history behind it that's more than just making seeds or corn soup. You know, there's, there's a lot of discussion that could take place mm. that I think our young people need more education on because they haven't been taught these things, you know, for so long. Yeah. So, Ange, if I was to take one of these kernels off the off the cob here, now it's, you said, at the seed phase, this could be used and, and put back in the ground for, you know, future planting and things like that. What are you typically looking for? I mean, you're looking for maybe the stronger ones. And I mean, obviously when corn got to this size, you know, some selective breeding, different things like that, that they right. did to kind of make it so that it was, you know, what, what sort of a, 
indicative of like a, a strong kernel or a strong a strong. Well, usually most of the corn that were uh, our Haudenosaunee varieties are um, eight rows. Mm. So our strongest. So know, explain the eight rows. That's eight are, rows around the. <laughs> there's eight rows. There should be eight rows around the cob. So you would you know say I'm starting with my thumb here. This is one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, right? And I'm back to the I'm back to the club. So there's four here, right? This is four and this is four. So that's eight rows of corn. So what you're looking for is that there's eight, they're straight, um, you know, they're healthy. And the strongest ones, I, I haven't come across one yet, but if I do, I'll show it to you. Um, there's what they call a line of demarcation where they're separated into groups of two two, four, six, and eight. And there's an actual line that's open in between the corn. That's like the strongest of all the seeds. So if you notice like your corn's starting to get smaller or it's starting to look a little funny shape or it's not that healthy, yeah. right? Um, there's The solution to that is to go to another corn farmer and swap seeds with that person. Mm. Give them a bushel of your corn and have them give you a bushel of theirs. Yeah. Go to another farmer and jumble them all together so you get some genetic diversity. Because if you'll see, if you, if you keep planting your own corn, just yours, yeah. over and over and over again, you'll start to see some irregularity. So it's mm. like anything in nature. You don't want to keep inbreeding something. So you want to make sure you bring somebody else's seats there mm. and we've done it many times there's been four or five or six of us corn farmers that'll all throw our, our seeds in a big tub and just jingle them all together and then take some of that back home with us mm. and, and then the next year you get a really big harvest right. you know of, of nice healthy corn yeah. very cool so then the breeding process is also like you know it's representative of our our nations and our people, right? We're, we're stronger when we're all connected and we're woven together like our communities. And what's happening to one is going to happen to all. So as they sit together and they dry throughout the winter, they're not alone. They're all together, bound together. And... It's, it's funny that all tribes used to do this, but a lot of people got away from it. So we've been like reminding places that we go in our in our corn travels. Some of the, the people forgot completely how to do it, you know. We traveled to the southwest last year. And I like to make, when I do my braids, I like to make them as tight to the center as I can so that they don't um, stretch as they dry and break and fall down. Some people get discouraged and then don't want to make a braid anymore if their braid falls apart. And I want to tell everybody that that's, that happens on purpose because the creator wants us to see that we're not perfect and that we can give something our all and our very best and still, but the whole point is to try again, keep going, try again. And, you know, these little struggles along the way sometimes. You can't just give up and say, well, my mind fell apart. I'm not going to do that anymore, you know. We've all had that happen. <laughs> Every single person. And it's like being human. We all make mistakes. Yeah, so when we when we see, like, say this one, like, we would make a separate seed braid of these really large, healthy ones. Yeah. You can also do that. Some people like to do that, or you can sort it out after it dries in the winter. Usually by midwinters, I say it's time. Hmm. It's usually dry by then. You can start shelling it. So if we harvest now in October, early November, usually by January, it, yeah. it's ready. It's dry enough yeah. to where you can start um, shelling it. And so the drying process, it's a combination of maybe just some airflow and, and circulating heat. air. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's why we used to always hang them over the rafters in the longhouse, is because there was heat yeah. and air movement with the door opening, yeah. you know, so there was always a constant, uh, there would be a smoke hole in the top, yeah. so the humidity wasn't piling up against the inside, you don't want to keep it totally enclosed with no airflow, corn always has to have the air moving. 
Okay, so I trimmed them down as close to the husk as possible so that I can keep the braid nice and tight. Yep. And then the way I start them is you always start with an X first. Okay. And then you flip this one over. So they almost look like they're tied together. Yep. Um, and then you enter your third one. So that's third. Okay, and then once you braid that one in, every time you have your thumb down, you're adding in another one. So that adds to your thumb. And you're going from side to side. So wherever your thumb, wherever the thumb is holding that down, that's where the next the next one is going. And so this process, the reason why we're even braiding is to get them to, to hang. Traditionally, we would have hung them in the longhouse. Yeah, they used to actually make braids like this that went over the top. Mm -hmm. They didn't have handles. Yeah. <laughs> so that the corn itself was draped over that. Yeah. And, um, oh, so they wouldn't have like a hook or something no, you're saying? No, no hook. Yeah. You would just... Yep. Drape it over the top. Drape nice, it over the top. Like that, yeah. yeah. And then, uh, from what I was told, and, I, and I've done some uh, uh, some reading of old journals and things like that, and in historical documents they talk about the time where they would fall. So, as people were dancing inside that longhouse, or, you know, because nowadays we don't live in them, we yeah. just have ceremony there, right? Yeah. So, um, ceremony and council. And, but... When they started falling to the ground, then it was time to, to shell them, you know, or, or they would, when you were dancing and they would jingle and, and knock some loose, hmm. then you would know that's how they're ready. And so it's a curing process. We're trying to dry them out, getting them prepared. And then once they hit that, that dry place, then they're time for shelling. That's, right, that's exactly. the next process. Yep, and then um, the shelling process is... Um, I used to wonder, like, what did we do when we were inside longhouses for winter activity? Like, honestly, if you think about when it gets really cold, what did we do? And uh, we did seed work. Yeah. That was a lot of our, uh, a lot of our winter work had to do with like preparing things for the next harvest. And so I've started doing some of that with my younger kids, and that's one of their favorite things to do. So I found kids who had issues with ADHD or, or just can't sit still for long periods of time and focus. Yeah. That was a great activity for them. They were the best ones at doing it. Yeah. Because it must be something they were missing and didn't know it. Yep. Because I was like, wow, you guys really surprised me. I was not expecting you to be able to keep still this long. And and they were the fastest ones, and they just loved it. I think it's that um, the tactile sensation of the sound it makes when they're dry and they kind of jingle together, like almost like beads, you know. Maybe beads took the place of that. But... So it kind of ties in again to like that idea and the concept around the food sovereignty thing, but then also the food is our medicine. And, right. You know, these and, and activities right here are, are medicine as well. You know, so I think all of this this handling, you know, not only out in the field, but all the way to that form when it's seed going in the ground. Yeah. It's always under the care, like children. It's yeah. being touched. It's being caressed. It's being. Um, nurtured and have affection, you know, with good thoughts. Yeah. And then it goes through many hands because sometimes maybe they're not the same people that picked it are going to be the people that are breeding it, breeding it and, or yeah. shelling it or yeah. planting. There could be different people at, at each juncture doing a different duty. And um, so it's getting a little bit of piece of all the village through yeah. that. Yeah, so I think a long that's... time ago, all our seeds were touched, you know, they were... They were not um, done by machinery, so that's why, like, I really impressed that this importance of still doing these braiding because um, it's that community building. It is. It's not. It's like the enjoyment of us all sitting in here and working together. Yeah, telling stories, mm -hmm. sharing, sharing information, Seeing exchanging. People we haven't seen in a while. Yeah, finding things out. Talking about like our gardens and what did we struggle with this year, or what did we see, or was there any messages that. Did we see anything different? Did we notice anything? So that was kind of like our our little climate panels. You know, that's yeah. how we found out what do we see that's different now. What should we pay attention to and mention to our medicine people or or take back to the village to tell everybody. Yeah. 
So yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of connections, you know, for doing these activities. And it's it's a communal thing where everybody's coming together, and you're ultimately, you know, this is going to get processed and it become food and nutrients for people and. Again, it's, it's part of that caring for one another, I guess, and, yeah. and doing those sort of pieces. Yeah, and also we, um, it's like you are the person who's doing the braiding. Even the people that are prepping it to get put into the braid, you're picking up the energy from the plants as well. So that's good medicine for you, even though it's a transfer. It's a transfer from it to you and you to it. So it's really important to have that connection. You know, I, sometimes I'm sad when I see like the farmers around me in the local area. They, there's no footsteps in their gardens. Mm. You know, like they ride tractors all day long and and they really do enjoy their method of farming, but there's no physical connection to any of the food. And that means food we're eating. Yeah. You know, because we eat a lot of that in the grocery stores and stuff like that. So, so it really is kind of that factory farming, mm -hmm. and you've kind of lost that connection to the, to right. the earth and to the to the plant itself. And, yeah. and that, that energy, like you had mentioned, that, that transfer of energy doesn't happen. Is Yeah, and that's part of the healing process, yeah. because we've all had experiences um, during the pandemic. I had... I had uh, an experience, you know, where I was injured and I had been in bed for almost a month. And I was just like, oh my gosh, my corn's almost ready. I, I gotta get there. But I was in so much pain, I didn't think I could. I had hurt my shoulder. And um, I ended up just dread forcing myself to get up out of bed and to go, you know, just to go, go to the garden. And I had such a difficult time driving there. I didn't tell anybody I was going. I just went. And when I got there, you know, the leaves were in full bloom. And I was just checking on to make sure everything was all right. And I was getting strangled almost by the corn. Because as you walk through there, the leaves wrap around you and everything. But it was kind of breezy. So I just stood there. And um, I just closed my eyes. And I could feel that corn wrapping around me. Mm. And it, I had a flashback of our teaching mm. from Guy Leo. And we had some late talks about how he, he had the same you know, scenario connection to the corn when he heard the voice. And it was all over my shoulder. And it, was, it was completely wrapped around my shoulder and around the top of my neck on the right side. And it even went under me, underneath in between my arm. Yeah. And I actually could feel like the pain leaving my body. Mm. And I healed enough, to, not all the way, but I healed enough to be able to still braid corn and still like go pick corn and harvest yeah. and carry it. And I was, ever since then, I was fine. Mm. And I was so thankful because I'm like, now when you have an experience like that, no matter what other people tell you, yeah. Like, nobody can shake my faith that I know that that really happened. Yeah. And so now I know his story that he was talking about in the Guy Leo when, he, when Jamie does the recitals and says his words exactly. I know that's true. Yeah. Because it happened to me. It was something similar. And I think that's how things are for a lot of us. It's like, you need to experience it, have your own experience with it, in order for you to truly have that belief and connection. And like cornfields are the first place to start. Yeah. <laughs> it really, really is. Because <laughs> even if you start just helping out at, at husky bees and things like that, that might spark a conversation with somebody, encourage you, or give you seeds, or might motivate you to want to grow corn. You know what I mean? By just yeah. being part of the process. And I think that's why we do all this communal work, because that's how they used to find people who who are going to keep it going when the older ones can't anymore, you know? Yeah. Let's look at these young people at the, you know, these uh, communal situations. So talking about the community then, have you started to see that more of that resurgence that people are starting to, to come back to, you know, traditional foods and starting to take more of an interest in these types yes. of things? I mean, is that something you've also seen from the pandemic as well, is that people are now a little bit more aware of the fact that, you know, there, are, there can be scarcity, there can be... You know, so, oh, yeah. so food production may be a, a, the next step to, you know, really kind of, you know, becoming that 
Yes. That's for sure. A lot of our um, prophecies are starting to happen. Mm. Things that we didn't think we were told them even 20 years ago. Oh, well, that can't really happen. Is that really true? You know, now you're, we're seeing these food shortages that we're predicting. Yeah. And like I said, I mean, it's not really doomsday prepping. It's just prepping for change because we're going through a lot of changes in you know, our climate. Every year there's something different that you have to struggle with, you know, that you didn't have before. And this year it was, um, you know, I felt so bad because the people in the Southwest had no rain, nothing, for months and months and months. And we had so much rain, you know, in an overabundance. Yeah. But we never, um, we never didn't want it, you know, so we always gave thanks every time it came, even sure. now in fall time. It doesn't usually rain in the fall, you know. <laughs> but yeah, we, um, there is more people that are getting involved, you know, that want to want to plant their food. There's actually a more, I, I think a lot of people have elevated their consciousness about where their food comes from. Yeah. Because people never put much thought into it. And so, you know, if you make it a rule of your life that you're not going to buy anything that comes in a box, yeah. you can start there. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't buy any food that comes in a box, but you have to actually hold it yourself and wash it off before you eat it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a really good start. <laughs> yeah. They say don't eat any food that comes in a box or a bag, <laughs> and you will never be diabetic. <laughs> wow. And I believe it. So you personally then, I mean, besides the story you shared about, you know, having that sort of healing moment or sort of that experience with the with the corn, like what have you experienced since working with, you know, this type of food and, you know, and, and being more in tune and being tapped into sort of that community of folks who are really looking at, you know, traditional foods, traditional practices, traditional farming methods and things like that. Like how is it affected you as a person and how do you feel and where do you where do you kind of see this going um, I, I know you're going to be with it you know for the rest of your life I mean I know that you're now becoming one of those you know those teachers one of those people who's sharing your information where do you see it going for yourself and how has it affected you well for me I'd like to see all six nations in the in the confederacy have get back to having a whole communal farming project and, and we're getting there right that was a few years ago four or five years ago that was like my main goal I wanted to see uh, everybody have one and even if it was something small you know because even this place this place motivated a lot of people to keep white corn growing it really did so it was you know the work of John Mohawk and then Pete kept it going there was one person that said I'm going to keep this going and that's all it really takes is to show our young people that it doesn't take a whole army sometimes it takes one person with the you know with the drive to put something together to make it happen and um, you can always start small and grow from there and for me I mean I don't know I feel like I'm entering a, a crossroads right now because I've been doing a lot of cooking yeah. a lot people really they like to try the indigenous foods, and a lot of the people don't know how to prepare. Yeah. And we forget about that. So you can't just tell people to eat well. You yeah. got to show them how. So I think cooking is going to be our next, um, you know, our next big wave of what's going to be necessary. Because yeah. before cooking was popular, but we weren't using all our traditional foods. You know, we were making substitutions, right? Yeah. Something similar to corn soup using say hominy that you buy in a can or you know things yeah. like that and yeah. um, now we can show people that you can actually make those things with traditional foods sure. so the other thing I, I found that um, our young people are really interested in and so am I is um, outdoor cooking yeah not relying on propane mm -hmm. fossil fuels electricity yeah. let's get back out there you'd be shocked at how many people don't know how to make their own fire yeah. even if you handed them a pile of wood yeah you know yeah. <laughs> they don't know how to make a fire 
And so we really have to go back to the basics. Yeah. Like learn how to dig a hole in the ground and put bury our food again, and, you know, and then dig it up in the morning and let it sit there all night. Yeah. We need to boil water with hot rocks. That's what I've been showing people how to do. Like, you don't need all these things, right? We can use wood vessels, clay pots. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you don't throw it right into the fire. You throw the clay pots by the, you know, to the side, right? So it's getting that radiant heat from the fire, but yep. it's not actually like getting burned. So I think that's where um, our our new movement is moving in the direction of food um, food preparation because people now they like growing in the ingredients. We've got people's attention to doing that and keeping their seeds, but now are they eating it? Yep. Do they know how to? you know, put that in there. Do they know that babies can eat all that stuff? Do they know those things? They can make all this. So that's what I, uh, that's been kind of my focus in 2021. I've done a lot of, uh, in, you know, cooking. And also I was thinking about, you know, how are we going to connect to all of our neighbors, right? Our non-Indigenous neighbors. And they've, haven't been exposed to our foods either in yeah. so long and we were so generous at one point with our foods you know and so now I think we have to start sharing sharing that uh, that gen that humanity that generosity again you know because a lot of times sitting down at a meal is where a lot of good conversation takes place yeah. instead of just sitting at a conference table yeah. or you're sitting in the audience and there's a speaker one speaker at the front yeah. that really isn't our way of learning you yeah. know we are everything we do is in circles right yeah and we got to get back to that as well so slowly but surely we're making progress you know and I think it's in, it's going to be important that we also learn long term um, food preservation yeah. because a lot you know seed saving and yep, food seed, banks or seed, seed, saving, seed banks and, and things and even um, one of the things I'm working on right now is having um, one of my guys build an underground cache like we used to have long yeah. ago made out of bark or even using lumber whatever we got to do to make it yep. in modern times and you know those uh, those food caches were always placed in not everybody knew where they were. Yeah. There might be one or two people in the village that knew where they were. And that's why you still find some today in archaeological <laughs> sites, because the people didn't know where they were. And that's kind of the whole thought. But even if we could, uh, we could get the basic model down of how it's built, how long it takes, and kind of just get the statistics on, okay, anyone can do this for this, you know. Instead of building this great big basement and you know all these other things, is there little simple ways that we can do food preservation in the long term? Hmm. And you know, since the Earth stays at a constant temperature, yep. it's like a natural uh, refrigeration. refrigeration. Yeah. yeah. So I'd like to see everybody get back into having one of those, even in their yard. Yeah. You know that they know you have this. Yeah, root cellars and things like that have kind of gone the way of the past, and right. people aren't really considering or even including those or incorporating those in traditional or new, or new building, I guess. Right. Yeah. Kind of being more green, you know, yeah. with our, uh, our construction. Right. One more. I'm going to make it flip my hand over. So we're now down to the end of the braid here. Okay, and now I'm going to flip three of them up and then I put it underneath here and I just make an upside down braid. The reason why I put it underneath the corn instead of up here is because the, the weight of the corn is so heavy. This way it doesn't ever fall apart. And then to finish it off, you're just going to tie it like a shoe. And there, and that's done. Hey, we are.